you've got to be able to put yourself out there because without risk, there's no reward. You've probably heard the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, if that were the case, Christopher Bryan might just be the ultimate storyteller. In this episode, I sit down with Christopher, a talented commercial photographer who has worked with a variety of clients, including ones from the Forbes Global Top 10. He sits down with me to share his knowledge as well as a little background and insight into his personality and some tips on headshots. And you might be surprised about what he has to say on that. He also lets us in on a project he's working on. It's a nonprofit that he's bringing to Tulsa that will provide keepsake portraits for people in need. As you'll learn, he's been a part of a team that has done this in the past, and he's seen the impact firsthand of what these portraits provide to the people who receive them. In fact, you're gonna hear a sweet story about one of the photos taken. Okay, welcome Christopher Bryan. Hello. Hello to the podcasting studio. Thank you. We met through a mutual friend Mm -hmm. and you have all these interesting things going on. So I knew that I wanted to get you in the studio to talk to you today. So I'm really glad that we're able to sit down and do it. Me too. Yeah. I've been looking forward to this. Good, good. Well, I always like to start out by finding out from my guests just a little bit about themselves. And so if you could kind of share that and then how you, you're a photographer and a little bit about your business. Okay. Well, I'm a commercial photographer Mm -hmm. and have been full-time commercial for a little over eight years and had my, the actual business for quite a while. And I started when I was about six with a camera in my hand and it just has always been part of my blood. So to say that I became interested in it is really kind of a misnomer. It just feels like it's been part of my DNA since the beginning. Okay. And I'm, I'm big on story and and the concept of story and the idea of story, because ultimately we are our story. Like that is the sum average of everything that we are, all of our experiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of, of the idea that story informs our past, Mm -hmm. but it dictates the future and it definitely defines the present. Mm -hmm. And as we're sitting there, you know, if we're just at home by ourselves one day, or if we're out in public with a large number of people looking at us, Mm -hmm. or if we're creating everything that we're doing is affecting, is affected by something that's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. It's the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, for lack of a better cliche, but it, it's all this this giant sea of, of, of water that touches other water and, and gets bumped around. And what happens tomorrow is absolutely a result of what happened today and the day before that. So how do you tell a story in commercial photography? I can see you telling a story with people, mm-hmm. but how do you tell a story in commercial photography? So- well, commercial photography is, to define that term quickly, so- is just focused on business to business photography. So a business needs advertising, it needs marketing, it needs to tell its story, either the services they provide, the products they provide, the people that run the business or a part of the business, their culture. People are involved in the shot nine times out of 10. Okay, perfect. So you're able to get them to pose a certain way because we try not to do candids Mm -hmm. in that sense that we want it to be specific. There's a story to tell, there's a message to convey. And that involves everything from the color of the clothes they're wearing to what type of clothing they're wearing to how their hair is done, makeup's Mm -hmm. done, uh, the environment around, how it's styled, the lighting. So many little aspects can absolutely shape that message. You know, even something as simple as light, if we flood something with light, it's nice and airy and ethereal and lifestyle-y. But if we go lower on the light, it's Mm -hmm. more dark and dramatic and edgy. Mm -hmm. That can completely shift how something is received. And the mind catches something in less than a tenth of a second and makes a snap decision based on what it sees. Mm -hmm. So if you're selling a car, the car is obviously the point. Mm -hmm. But if it's selling the brand that the car is attached to, then the people, the dealership, the salespeople, the service people, that's a big part of it. So you got to make sure that you're showing the friendly side of that with the car. It's mm-hmm. not just the people because if you can take a shot and there's no connecting asset mm-hmm. in that shot to what a company is or what they sell or who they are, then it's just another stock photo. But it's 
making sure all of the elements speak to each other. If you've got something in there that doesn't work, doesn't connect, it actually creates dissonance mm -hmm. and it breaks the, the train of thought, then that's a big problem. You have to work around that. So commercial photography is something that when you're doing a shoot, it's a very planned out mm -hmm. in advance, but that's how we tell the story. Okay. You, I know you're a detailed person and you have <laughs> very, you'll admit very. very, but that's, do you think that's your superpower? It's one of, I mean, I, I see, I'm one of those people that can see things at the 50,000 foot view, but yeah. I can also see it at the microscopic view. The funny thing is I run my business in a very interesting way. A lot of people run business with the goal of making money. And money is absolutely critical to, you know, I got to pay the bills. I got to pay taxes. I got all these, I have gear I have to buy, but I, I run it with a 51-49 balance. So 51% of my interest is actually creating photos and telling stories. I care more about what I do than how much I make at it, but only a little bit more because if I did like a 90-10, I'd be doing everything for free and I'd be on the street mm -hmm. because it just wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't deliver the product in the end. So the money allows me to do what I love to do and to create the level that I create but I care more about that product going out the door and how it looks because my name's attached to it. Even if it's not attached to it, the people that hired me to do it know I did it. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that is the best it can possibly be and that that relationship is maintained. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what you have learned over the course of this time being an entrepreneur, being a business owner and your personality because I would guess, you know, I think, you know, how people make preconceived notions mm -hmm. and make snap judgments. And we talked in the beginning when we first met about your personality and how maybe you've come across and how you've had to work on that over time as you're building your business and how you learn to do that. So mm -hmm. I wanted you to share a little bit about that because I, I think that is so important. It's, it's a tricky thing. I am, wh whether you subscribe to this or not, I, I'm an Enneagram one. I mean, I am, I am type A perfectionist. I, I think more logically than emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I see the world and I'm like, why doesn't everybody else see the world this way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why can we not communicate like this? Uh, back when I worked in private sector, you know, working for the man, so to speak, uh, when I had day jobs, I would get chastised regularly for my emails. And it wasn't that I was being mean or rude to them. It was they just had no fluff to them. There was no emotion in them. It was a direct answer. Somebody asked a question, I sent it back. And to them, it came across as being mean or rude or short. And, and it was short. I mean, literally was short. Sometimes it was the word no <laughs> in an email. And it wasn't, it wasn't me trying to like put the inflection on there because with text and things along those lines, you, it's hard to do that, you know, and you don't put smiley faces and emojis in professional emails, at least back in the day you wouldn't. So it's, it's something that over time I've had to temper it and I'll type it out and, and look at it again. And now I, I even have Lisa looking at it. You know, my girlfriend, she, uh, has her own business and she has a good set of eyes to look at it as well. And, but she is also a type one. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where it gets real fun and interesting. But the learning to do these things has, has come with some pain, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that I uh, am not going to burn a bridge accidentally yeah. and is to put me in a position where I have to overcome or recover because that's a lot more painful that is. than just sitting there for an additional five minutes and looking at an email. Putting okay. Into it. Let me ask you about this, though, too. Being an introvert versus an extrovert, mm. I want... Yeah. How would you self-describe? So I'm an ambivert, uh, not an official term to uh -huh. my knowledge, uh -huh. but uh, I'm, I, I'm an introvert with extroverted tendencies or capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the Myers-Briggs, which I've also taken, uh, I actually am both an INTJ and an ESTJ. So that's both introvert and extrovert. But those were taken, I want to say, a couple years apart. And it was interesting how they gave different results, but they were very similar. Both times, my, my first letter was on the line between the two. Mm -hmm. And I prefer quiet. I have a very, very, very small close circle of friends. It's I don't have to be the life of the party. In fact, I'm the wallflower. I will sit back, especially if I'm in a room that I don't know anybody. I'm not Mr. Go up and introduce myself and interject and like, oh, look at me. Ha ha. Never been a party person. I like one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, very small group. And 
that's where I, I thrive. That's where I sit the best. But there are times I have to turn it on. When you run a business, you've got to connect. You've got to reach out. You've got to be able to send the email, make the phone call, walk up to somebody at an event or you know in a restaurant if you recognize them, something along those lines. But you've got to be able to put yourself out there because without risk, there's no reward. And that's something that's insanely painful, even today. You know, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, and that's very difficult for me sometimes. Uh, you know, if I haven't had my coffee, if there's any number of things. You guys that, and your coffee. I love coffee. Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that can get in my way. But most of the time, what gets in the way most is my head, me. Fear of rejection, fear of the no, fear of all of these things. Um, so I stay quiet most of the time. And that, that is a detriment. That is something that works against me. But when you run a business, especially in something, in a, an industry where anybody can be a photographer, and I'm using air quotes here, it's it's very important to stand out. And it's hard to stand out when you're not, you don't lean to be very social mm-hmm. in that respect. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an introvert, that allows me to be more focused on the details. And I can see those, like I can tell that story in my head a lot quieter mm-hmm. and flesh it out versus being a butterfly and going around from thing to thing to thing. And, you know, and I'm generalizing a lot of terms here because there are aspects and character qualities of each side that, that are different than that. But if you're a wallflower, if you're somebody that, that is an introvert, that just can't get out there and do things, you absolutely can be a business owner. Did you work um, yourself up to that though? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Two businesses where I, I, set, I would go to chamber events and people would have to come up to me and introduce themselves. Like, who are you? Why are you here? We see you with these things, but you never talk to anybody. And I'm like, yeah, it, well, once we got started, like I can build that relationship quickly on a one-on-one if they initiate. But if that was back in the day, now I can do it. I just have to say, okay, here we go and jump in and, and go for it. Once the relationship's built, once the introduction is done, all bets are off. I, I rock and roll. Mm-hmm. But it's that initial coming across i focus a lot on first impressions which is why headshots are such a big deal which is the branding everything i do is about the story and you get one first impression and it's it's hard to fix it if you don't do it right Mm -hmm. there's always going to be that thing in the back of the head that somebody remembers thank you for your honesty with that because there are so many people i think more people than not that feel that way and that's hard to share a lot of times mm-hmm. and put into words. So I appreciate Absolutely. you sharing that. So you also gave me the perfect segue because one of the things we talked about is a headshot. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you are an expert in headshots. I ask my students to submit a headshot um, and to put on LinkedIn. And um, so I thought, if who better to ask some tips? <laughs> Christopher, than you. So um, if you can kind of tell me maybe what you look at that goes into a headshot and then maybe a, a couple of tips maybe for people to think about if they're doing their own, you know, on their iPhone or, mm-hmm. or their friends taking it. or There are a ridiculous number of, of aspects and approaches to a headshot. And there are things that are non-negotiable, at least the way I see them. Uh, and then there are things that there's a lot of variability. The big thing you want to look at is what story are you trying to tell? What kind of job are you looking for? Or if you own a business, what are you communicating to potential clients uh, as to your personality type, your approachability, your professionalism, how serious you are? You know, if it's somebody that's, let's say, a, a high level corporate litigator, you know, they're not going to sit there with a big goofy grin on their face in, in the headshot. They're going to be, you know, I'm a killer in the courtroom kind of thing. But if it's, let's say, a general practitioner, a doctor, mm-hmm. or a pediatrician, you know, you want to have that approachability. Nobody, no parent wants to take their child to a doctor that looks like he's angry all the time. <laughs> and, you know, so there's there's that, that vibe of, uh, it's a very important thread. And the mind, again, makes that decision in a tenth of a second or less when they see a face. We are still very much connected to our prehistoric roots. Everything from micro expressions to body language, all the nonverbals, that is very much a part of our DNA still. And we can see somebody's eyes, how they're squinted, the turn of their mouth, their approach, how their head's turned, how their body's turned. And that speaks more in that microsecond than any amount of bio or words or backing up their education or ability can do. It's part of your personal brand. Everybody's got a personal brand, whether they realize it or not. You know whether they're in business or not. They could be a volunteer. They could be, they could be the president. You name it. There is a story attached to each and every person, and how you present that is your brand, 
And I know that word gets thrown around a lot. It's become overused and cliche. No, I love that you're talking about that. It's, it's the world that we live in. Yeah. It's reputation. Mm-hmm. And it's important to maintain that brand and cultivate it the right way, but do it authentically. You're not trying to create a message that isn't true because people will see through that or the house of cards will fall down on you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, uh, I guess that's kind of a pun to use that specific phrase there. Um, but it, it's, it's a thing that you got to maintain, you got to take care of it and you've got to keep it updated. So you don't just do something once and say, Oh, this is going to last me for time in memoriam. It is something you cultivate, you take care of, which is why I say a headshot over the two years old is gone. Get oh, rid of it. Oh, okay. So my general rule of thumb is every six months is short, way short. Some people live in a world where branding is important and they're doing them every six months. A year to a year and a half is kind of the target. Hairstyles change, fashion changes, people age. You want to be able to have that quick connection there and the visual recognition of who somebody is based on their their headshot, their their presence. And how you take the headshot's important, what you're wearing is important, getting sleep and being hydrated is important. If you're tired and you know you haven't been drinking water properly, your face is gonna show that. That is so interesting that you're saying that, even about sleep and hydration. Before you shoot, do you acknowledge that mm-hmm. or give that them the information you need to be hydrating? It's not like they're an athlete, but no, it's not. you need it's, to be hydrating, get a good night's sleep. I have a full guide that I send out in a PDF wow. when somebody books a session with me. It gives them tips on what to wear, what they're wearing communicates. And it gives them like three different examples. I have, I have a, a set for the women and a set for the men. And they're just wardrobe options. But they're not hard and fast rules. You don't have to do that. But it just gives information to think about on the wardrobe side. But then there are steps like, again, the hydration. Make sure you're drinking multiple days beforehand. Not like getting overly bloated with water. But, right. you know, just drink the proper amount. And then get sleep. And then don't get your hair cut the day before. Or day of in some cases. Because uh, you can always tell when a haircut's fresh. And right. that shows up in the photo and you're like, Ugh. but yeah, I have a full PDF that goes out in the email when somebody's booked and, and they get the full rundown. Cause I try to make it as accessible as possible. And again, working smarter, not harder. I'm trying to make sure they're not freaking out right. of what do I do? What do I do? And I don't want them like going the night before through their wardrobe options. Right. And because if you're panicked, it's chaos, you're not going to make good decisions. It's, mm-hmm. you've got to be calm when making decisions like that. Uh, you know, and some people, they can have nothing but designer label that's all tailored and perfectly fit and whatnot. And yeah, they could probably walk into the closet and in 20 minutes pull out four options, five options and nail it. (laughs) Yeah. That's the, not the majority Mm -hmm. of the world. It just all comes down to what you want to talk about. So when somebody comes into my studio, I don't shoot cold. I don't say, okay, let's do this and get into it. I'll sit there and because a lot of people do not like their photo being taken. So I have had to become a part-time psychologist. And, and I say this loosely because I am not a psychologist. <laughs> I have no <laughs> formal training. But I have a lot of years of living with social anxiety myself and having to read people's expressions, even subconsciously, and picking up on body language and knowing when something's not right. Knowing when uh, I've either hit a chord in a good way or I may have stepped on something that's a little off. And knowing where those vulnerabilities are and those strengths are in those moments to be able to coach them through that that session. I don't expect anybody to come in and just nail it because any photographer that does that is not doing their job. The goal is to take care of the client and tell their story in the best way possible. And if you are not bringing that out, coaxing that story out, then to do that, I have to create, I have to do something that's good and create a, a good solid story, but always maintaining the truth through that. And I, I can always see what is good in somebody and be able to say, this is what we need to focus on. This is what we need to pull out. The term photogenic gets thrown around a lot. I will be straight. And this may make people angry, but the simple fact of the matter is certain people look a certain way. That's all there is to it. The beauty standard that we live in this world that is, that is pushed out there belongs to the tenth of a tenth of a tenth of a tenth of a percent of the subset of a population, those people that are symmetrically perfect, that are put in magazines on the rep catwalk, they're freaks of nature. <laughs> they are not normal. Yet we have elevated this level of perfection 
And that does not exist. So every face is different. Everybody's posture is different. The overwhelming majority, like 99 plus percent of the world, don't have symmetric eyes. They have one that closes more than the other. And it may be a millimeter. It may be one that drifts a little bit. It may be one that's higher a little bit. And my goal is to help them completely forget about that because that does not dictate their value. It does not dictate anything about who they are as an individual. It is us saying, okay, here's where we're going to work and we can adjust. We can move around and we're going to get a great shot that communicates who they are by coaching through that process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So speaking of great shot and giving that picture of who they are through a photo, I want to talk about your heart for a project that you are putting together. This hell portrait? Yes. yes. So tell us what the project is, okay. because I think this is so neat. I think it's coming together right now, mm-hmm. and I want people to know about it and be able to get invested in it and share it with others. And so anyway, if you'll tell us the name of it and what you're doing. Okay. So Hell Portrait is an event that I did not start this event. I did not create it. Uh, It was started over 15 years ago by a photographer by the name of Jeremy Cowart. Uh, He's out in Nashville. He's a fantastic photographer. He's done album artwork cover for Garth Brooks, Carrie Underwood, several other people. He works with a lot of big names. And his idea was to do a one-day event where he would bring photographers together that volunteered their time. It was not about the photographer. It was about what they were doing. And on that day, they would come in and take and print family portraits for those that typically can't afford it. As I've mentioned, I'm not cheap. And photography, even even the, the lowest end of the, the, the rate scale, is still inaccessible to a lot of people, uh, especially if they happen to be homeless or in, in any number of, of things that are... Uh, fighting them and, and coming against them, an obstacle that they're they're having to overcome. And the goal for that day, and I, I try to do this every, like try to live this way every day, and it, I'm not perfect at it by any means, but on that day, everybody that comes through that door is our honored guest because we're we are focusing on individuals that are typically invisible to the rest of the world. They have a story, but it's not being told. It's not being seen. A lot of people ignore individuals that are either on the street or are hungry, that aren't getting fed, that are in certain parts of town. Uh, And it's, it's wrong because we're human across the board. Our value is the same. It doesn't matter whether we have billions in the bank or nothing in the bank. And society works in a way, unfortunately, where we attach value to people based on their possessions and their money and what they can contribute to the world. You know, and and there are a lot of privileges that some of us have been given. And I did this event for three years in my previous location and then COVID hit. So when I moved to Tulsa during the pandemic, uh, I knew I wanted to do this here. I lived in downtown originally and I saw so many instances where I said, I need to photograph this person. I need to make sure that, and it wasn't for me because that's, that's the thing about this event. When we do this, all the photographers wear the same shirt. We don't advertise our studio. The only mention of our businesses is in turn for their volunteering. We put their logo on the list of people that have sponsored and volunteered for the event, but that's it. So we all wear the same shirt and it is about who is getting in front of that lens that day. And we, we print it right there. We frame it right there. And our goal for this year, for 23, we're, we're trying to lock down the venue because scale is a big deal. I have a dream of what I want to accomplish. And it's a dream that involves filling the BOK Center. Wow. Okay. I mean, we're talking 50 plus photographers and I want to fill that arena. Now, if we have to go to a different location, so be it. But... The goal is not to do a one and one and done either, because we have transient population, we have people coming in and out, but then we have people that can't make it. I want to partner with the city of Tulsa. I want to find a way to get Tulsa Transit to be able to bus people in for this. I want to find ways to make sure that there are no obstacles for individuals to experience this. It breaks my heart that something like this even needs to exist, and I can I can wax poetic about it all day long. Uh, what does that do for people though when they come in? And if you could kind of share what share about that, because I think you have some really cool stories. Yeah. I have I have two specific stories, and I will cry on one of them. It happens every time without fail. Uh, but the first one 
it was our, I think our second year we did this. Uh, we had a family that we printed their eight by 10 and they walked out with it. And I know listeners can't see my hands, but they're holding it like this, this just cherished family heirloom because it was Mm -hmm. at that moment, they did not have any family portraiture and, and they were treating that thing like it was baby Jesus. I mean, it's like this Mm -hmm. holding it in their hands and just putting it out and, and being very slow with how they walked and not putting their fingerprints on it. And I saw that and all the work, all the effort, all the exhaustion and stress that had gone up to putting the event together disappeared when I saw that happen. And it, it broke my heart, but it was, it was a, okay, we're, we're making the impact. We're accomplishing what we're setting out to accomplish. Our second year that we did this, I always operate as the last photographer when I'm doing the event. Cause I, I, I'm making sure the fires are put out as the former IT guy that, you know, for 20 years I was IT before I started the studio full time. I'm fixing the computers. I'm making sure everything's working. The printers are kicking out things. So I'm running around like crazy. And I walked by the framing table and, and there was a, a lady there. Uh, you could tell that she had lived a life, that, that she was, she had experienced a lot of things. And she had this silver hair, like striking, like reflective silver hair, this bright red sweater. And I'm walking by, I looked down at the photo, I looked at her and I said, that's a beautiful photo. I mean, I'm so glad you came in today. I'm so glad we were able to take care of this for you. And before I could get much in, I got pulled off to something else. And one of the volunteers came up to me afterwards and, and said, did you get her story? And I said, Un- unfortunately not. I mean, I didn't have enough time to. Um, it got pulled 20 different ways. And they said, that's most likely the last photo that's ever going to be taken of her because she has decided to stop cancer treatment. And that was her gift to her kids for Christmas. And I, I broke, like I'm breaking now. And I've, I've told the story 50 times and every time it gets me. And I immediately, I'm like, we have to find her because she had walked out the door and, and we couldn't find her. I was going to print 10 more copies right then and there for her, just so her kids didn't have to share a copy and we never could find her. And I hope she's still with us. That was in 2018. Uh, I know the odds are she's not, and it breaks my heart, but I know that because of that event, there is a photo of her now that exists where her kids can always look at her and remember her in a happy place and just her, no distractions, no, no anything else, just her. And that made everything worth it a hundred percent. And you know, the the night before these events, I'm like, I'm never doing this again. I'm exhausted. (laughs) I'm just, I'm so beat up. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm never doing this again. And then by the end of the day, the next day, I'm like, yeah, I can't wait till next year. It's going to be fun. So this this year, again, none, none of this that I've mentioned so far is set in stone. This is not. So how can people way, but... find out about any details that you might have? Could they start following you? Yeah. So if they reach out to me, follow Christopher Bryan on Facebook. And uh, it's my logo is a, it's a red C and B together because uh, there are a couple of Christopher Bryans out there. Uh, make sure it's the one here in Tulsa. And um uh, I can get you the information. I can make sure that you're connected with that. Get you on the email list when we start pushing things out. Because we do want it out there. We want volunteers. And the big thing is we want other agencies here in town that provide services to individuals that we're targeting to be there, to be involved in this. We don't want this to just be a photo opportunity. We want this to be an all-inclusive event. Uh, In the past, We've had uh, food sponsors that have come in and cooked hot dogs and hamburgers. And so while people are waiting, they can have a quick bite. In, in the last location, we had the local United Way there, and they were connecting individuals to their partner agencies because making sure that we get that community connection out there and that we are providing more than just a portraiture. Because the portraiture, it's the icing on the cake. I feel it's important because there are plenty of studies that show that kids that see photos of themselves develop differently in a positive way. It gives them identity. It helps them with their identity. And if they don't have photos of themselves, it's it's less of an identity and they have less to attach to. And that, that's kind of like getting the foot in the door. The thing is we can't fix the world. We can't fix the problems. But if we don't provide access to resources to connect everybody to the resources they, they need or they want, or maybe they don't even know they need or want, is is what's 
most important to me. When I draw my last breath, I want to have left a mark on this world. I don't need my name anywhere. I just want to know that ultimately the stories I told, the images I captured, the lives that I impacted, it all mattered. Okay. Well, th- I'm going to wrap up with that because that is incredible. Your heart for helping and lending your talent and time to something like that is incredible. Okay. So I know that you're leaving a mark. I know you've already left a mark, but I, I am happy that you are continuing on to to do this event. So anyway, thank you for that. But I appreciate you visiting with me today. I always enjoy catching up and I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and being so vulnerable. (laughs) We could talk really about so much more. We really could. Anyway, and so I'll have to have you come back, but thanks for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, everybody. That's a wrap on this week's episode. I want to thank you for listening to the Sharing Passion and Purpose podcast. It means the world to me, and I'd love to connect with you. Please follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Sharing Passion and Purpose and Twitter at Passion Sharing. Also, if you like this podcast, it would mean a lot to me for you to subscribe, rate, and review it. And as always, all my show notes will be available on my website, sharingpassionandpurpose.com.